Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Roo. Thank you very much for joining again for the Monks Podcast. Our discussions My have been among, our discussions have been very stimulating and quite appreciated by thoughtful devotees. So I thought today we could discuss a topic of how we as a move is gone as a movement. We could say Krishna Consciousness started from India. It's or it's from India originally, but now it's spread all over the world. Prabhupada started in America, and we can say that presently we are not. very uh, certainly not as strong as in america as we were in prabhupada's times and there is uh, an increasing cultural distance that is seeming to be there between india india and the west so we i thought we could talk about western perceptions of india how they have been historically mm. and then how they have were in prabhupada's times how they have changed now and how that affects mm. uh, people's receptivity towards indian mm. spirituality Yeah, important subject. So I'm glad you thought to bring that one up. Thank you. So, bro, if we start from the past, it seems, uh, say, India was colonized by the British, and uh, initially in the 17th, 18th centuries, uh, or 18th, 19th centuries, also early 19th centuries, there was not that much interaction between India and, say, America, as there was between India. and the india and uk or europe primarily so before we go into the specifics of perceptions so, so when we see us the west traditionally you would say probably in the in pakistan swatakus times west might have meant uh, uk like going abroad itself might have meant uk or europe the prabhupa chose to go to america and now west often refers to a broad generic uh, world view so maybe you could explain what we mean by the west and why the west is so influential or why western perceptions matter so much i i like what gandhi used to say when people asked him what did he think about western civilization he said oh it was a good idea <laughs> so bro last time also he had quoted this so i'm sure gandhi was being sarcastic when he said it's a good idea Of, of course <laughs> but you know you just, uh, we yeah so the west has failed miserably to live up to its own promise unfortunately it's been very good at self promotion you know the, what people call the west is generally hollywood it's what they know in the movies it's what they know from uh the kind of public perception the popular perception of the west Oh. um it's it's a cliche the west when you say the west you know as opposed to the east um historically <clears throat> as you said india was uh, an enslaved nation you know british were at the first you go back to the turks you go back to the moguls you know there were many different uh, foreign peoples who came into india mm. uh looking to exploit the wealth The, you know the riches in those in those days 15th 16th centuries spices were more valuable than gold so there was this <clears throat> perception of let's get into india and <laughs> i'm you know doing, i'm researching a, i'm trying to write a biography of chaitanya mahaprabhu there's oh, one um, okay. story about uh, around 1500 vasco da gama arrived in india from portugal having been sent by the king with the mission of uniting the christians of india there was a christian community in india at that time and um okay. creating a united front, uh, front and uh, defeating islam the gama arrives in kolkata okay. kolkata and uh, the first thing he does is he sees a a, a temple a vishnu temple and he thinks oh i found the christians this is a big church here and he goes inside he sees all the deities and he says oh these are strange statues of the christian saints and then he hears there's a kirtan going on hari krishna hari ram he says oh they're chanting hail mary hail christ so he was very happy that he had discovered the christian anyway the point is <laughs> okay. for a, a long time India was subjugated and because Indian culture is a respectful culture um hospitality is um an important quality 
you know, raised in a, a you know Brahminical culture, you you're you're taught to receive a guest as good as God. Mm. So people were received, and they were uh, the British in particular because they had a certain kind of classy uh, um, attitude. They were welcomed, um, and what people under what for for many hundreds of years, the impression that people had in the West was any, whatever they had learned from Christian, British missionaries and administrators and scholars who came and essentially gave a very um, slanted perspective on, on Indian culture. Uh, so the perception of India up until the mid-60s, mid-1960s, I would say, going back to the East India Company, you know, in the 1600s, was of a backward nation where people worshipped idols. And they, anyway, we don't need to get into all the details. The point is that there was this very slanted, picture drawn by the historians, by the uh, people coming into India. They were called the Orientalists at one time. Their agenda was at a certain point to convert the quote unquote Hindu heathens to Christianity. Yeah. And there was a lot of propaganda made against deity worship. In fact, of all the deities that uh, the British found objectionable, the most objectionable was Krishna, because Krishna was the one deity who behaved in a, you know, an illicit manner, you know, dancing with these, other, these wives of other people and so on. At least the other gods, they performed some administrative function, you know, so they were somewhat quasi-respectable. And even the Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita was respectable because he was a teacher and he was a... Uh, a, a warrior and so on. So the British made a distinction, not the British, but those administrators who chose to write and comment on what they perceived a quote unquote Hindu culture. They, this, they separated the, the Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita from the Krishna of the Bhagavad Purana. Oh, it's from that the time. Krishna of the Gita. I had read about huh? this. I had read about the yeah. separation that they think of Krishna as a syncretic figure. But it started at that time itself. I didn't know that. I thought, okay. Yeah, it, it, it came primarily from the British who said, this Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita, he's teaching some good lessons for life, you know, about respect for duty and so on. This other Krishna, he's a, he's a very bad role model, especially for young people. How can we promote someone, you know, a village deity who dances with women in the moonlight, uh, this is immoral behavior. And um, so mm -hmm. there was this propaganda against bhakti. Where, well, that's where you and I are going. We're going to how have perceptions of India mm -hmm. in the West influenced the reception of bhakti in the West. That's true. So the first thing the first thing to understand is most people's understanding up until the mid-60s, I'll, I'll explain why the mid-1960s in a minute, but up until that time, the impression that people had was more or less whatever reports had been brought back by the British from India. And they were the most, you know, irresponsible, insulting, inaccurate uh, condemnation of, of Hinduism. Uh, that you can imagine. Yeah, the British were even the first ones to invent the word Hindu. I mean, the, that's true. Hindu was not a religion until the British began taking census studies in the 1600s. Yeah. When the British came in, you know, after Aurangzeb's death, more or less the Mughal period comes to an end, the British see this as an opening to in, in, in make India a colony of, of England. And so the first thing they do is they start taking a census. And in the British census, they ob ob obligated people to say, are you um, 
Muslim or Hindu. Otherwise, there was no such thing as Hindu. So, I mean, everything the, that we know about the Hindu. nomenclature might not be there, but uh, and Aurangzeb had this jazia tax, which he imposed specifically on people who are not Muslims. I don't know what he called yeah. them, because uh, he must have called them something. And they call them the Sindhus. Sindhus. People from on the other side of the Sindh River. They were the Sindhus. And then because they pronounced their S's like H's, the Sindhus became the Hindus. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the idea, whether Hinduism is a, is a, like a construct or a reality that's whole a volatile topic, because sometimes that idea that Hinduism is a construct is, to, is used to deny that there's any such thing as Hinduism at all. And sure. Then sure. that kind of reductionism also alarms and anger some followers of the way this. So I think the point no, I, you're making is that things have been misrepresented. Mm. That's it. That's it. And yeah. because I'm, you know, we're we're having an abbreviated discussion about of course, yeah. if we could have this discussion for a whole semester, you know, of university that's study. That's true. So we're we're mm. packing a lot of things, and and it's going to be somewhat inaccurate because we're making it so abbreviated. Yes, true. Just to but add the one point, point, generally, being, yeah. to add one more point is, I mean, I'd also heard about this. Uh, the bhakti, the, the temple worship, and the and the bhakti religions were were derided. They were mocked and they were considered like they had even a like a intellectual interpretation by which they said that these are all recent deviations. And somehow they seem oh, yes. to, yeah. they seem to say that the Advaitic interpretation was like the original original religion. So Max yeah. Muller and some other Paul Dusen and all of them they did that. So it was yeah. not only devotion was downplayed or derided, but you can say almost the opposite of devotion was also highlighted. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, not just exactly. Highlighted, you could say it, was, it was like the it was made to seem as the that is the real real Hinduism or real Vedic teaching or Vedantic teaching, whatever. Sure. Now there were you're raising an important point. Why why was this the case? Well, one reason was that. Uh, what the British and other outsiders coming into India were responding to was not the actual bhakti religion at all. They were responding to the Sahaja uh, misappropriations. So when you read some of the quotes from the missionaries and, and others about you know, this um, uh, em embarrassing, immoral behavior, they're not responding to, you know, Chaitanya Bhakti. They're responding to the owls, bowels, Prakriti Sadhya, all of the different deviant groups who arose. There were some before Mahaprabhu. Most of them came after Mahaprabhu passed away. And they were using the Radha Krishna paradigm as a pretext for uh, uh, wanton sexual behavior. That, really? in that sense, they were right to object to it. You know, they were they were correct in objecting to what they perceived of bhakti culture, because it was uh, abominable. It was immoral. It was it was licentious, but it was not the real bhakti culture. So that's one reason why there was this aversion to devotional practices. The other is that. Um, Shankara had become so powerful in India. Uh, <laughs> why? Well, one reason is that uh, what what he was promulgating was very attractive. You know, namely that when you come to the fulfillment of your yoga, when you come to the perfection of your meditation, uh, your material uh, ego dissolves and you become, you know. One with everything. Jagat Satya, Mama Satyam Jagat Mitya. This world is an illusion. We're all God. We all become God. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> I'll go for that. You know, bhakti required austerities. Bhakti required that you control those material impulses. You control that ego of wanting to become God and become servant of God. So, you know, that's, 
I mean, there are many different reasons why the impression in the West of India has been so upside down. Another reason is the first exponents of what we're calling Hindu culture to come to America were South Indian yogis who, rep who were also putting down the bhakti tradition as the vestige of some undeveloped period in India's history. You made mention of this a moment ago, that um, the real tradition is the Vedantic, you know, Advaita Vedanta. You know, that, that's the real thing. You read um, uh, uh, S. Radha, Radha Krishnan, first vice president of India, in his uh, commentary on Bhagavad Gita, I think it's ninth chapter, where Krishna Thank says, you. yeah, yeah, come to me, surrender unto me. <laughs> and he says, uh, it's not Krishna. You know, it's to the unborn speaking through Krishna that we have to give ourselves up utterly. Mm. So, you know, that's not Bhagavad Gita. That's, that's you know, his misinterpretation. But when uh, Vivekananda spoke in Chicago, the World's Fair, 1890, 1886, I think. 1893, I think, Chicago. Yeah, he... He said uh, it, it was condemning with faint praise. He told the audience, don't, uh, don't put down these people in my country for worshiping idols. Uh, it is the attempt by inferior minds, lesser intellects, to grasp very high complex truths. <laughs> so he's, he's saying, <laughs> saying, be patient with them. When they, when they come up and see the light, they'll recognize that actually we all worship the one unborn, non-manifest supreme being. So he was attempting to win over the Christians by stripping away the parts of Hindu culture that they found objectionable. Uh, all right, you don't like Krishna? Okay, let's get rid of Krishna. You don't like deities? Okay, that's just for the, for the beginners. Mm -hmm. so, you don't need to get, get upset about it. The higher stages for people like you and me, we understand it's all the one. So there's a lot of reasons why. So it's interesting. Western you know, interpretation. Yeah, like you talk about two distinct factors. So Western perceptions of India were shaped by Westerners looking at India in a particular way, and also by Indians presenting India in a particular way. That's both it. Ways. Exactly. So it's exactly both 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 sides. Both sides. Okay. But now just now to, I wanted. Yeah, just yeah. To introduce it. It just seems still there was some kind of almost, uh, I don't romantic or uh, appreciative attraction toward Krishna, toward India, among quite a few thinkers, especially in America, Emerson and Thoreau, they seem to appreciate the Bhagavad Gita. So how did that happen? Or was that? Uh, yeah. Right. Well, you're re you're referring to the transcendentalists. Yes who were most active up until about the time of the, uh, the, the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s. By the time the Civil War was over, most of the transcendentalists were dead. And their influence was just as romantic poets in courses uh, for high school of American history. They didn't have a very lasting effect. But that was a, a romantic reaction to the kind of industrializing that was going on you know that by uh, the america by the mid 1800s was uh, building railroads constructing cities you know westward ho you know um uh, build your wealth you know get land uh, uh you know, uh, become prosperous. You know, it's the, 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 the Protestant ethic. You mentioned, I think you mentioned mm. Max Weber a little while ago. Or yeah, Max Weber. If you read, yeah, you read him, he'll, he, you know, the, the, the Protestant ethic was, uh, you know, God wants you to become rich <laughs> sort of thing. So there was that reaction against that by the transcendentalists, you know, Walden Pond and so on, this very, idealized uh, utopian view of what human life can be. Um, but for the most part, that's at least today, you won't find 
you know, that idealism has kind of all dissipated. And we're back to just, you know, wanting to earn money. So, by the way, when you're using. So, yeah, idealism, it's always been there, something. A little bit is, little appreciation has always been. When you're using the word idealism, are you using the reference to the philosophy that there is only. That the philosophy is also that, that only ideas are only something beyond matter is the ultimate reality. Are using idealism in the sense that some noble ideals that people were uh, trying to aspire for, but those ideals, but that aspir that uh, that aspiration toward that ideals uh, waned away. It did. Uh, you know, there were many utopian movements in America, you know, not not just the transcendentalists. Um, and they had some appeal, but they were rather naive. You know, they were predicated on the notion <clears throat> of, a, of achieving material equality. Now, we know that that's impossible. There's no such thing as material equality. Mm. The, uh, the, the beauty of bhakti philosophy, the beauty of Bhagavad Gita and so on, is that it, it points to the spiritual equality of all beings. Materially, there will always be differences. So artificially to say, well, we're going to have, uh, we're going to make a society. The, the socialists uh, and communists in uh, late 19th century Russia did the same thing. <clears throat> we're going to have a classless society. Well, that didn't work. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a, trying to create heaven on earth. Right? Uh, what happened was that it always dissipates because there's always a ruling class that emerges. You might say everyone is equal, but this group is more equal than the others, you know, and, and the system is for their benefit. And it lost appeal as well because people didn't like the idea of uh, such uniformity. You know, I don't want to become just like everybody else. And that wasn't very appealing. The American image is one of the rugged individuals, you know, be yourself. I, I found this advertisement uh, I don't know. If, I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see it. Can a club be with all its members think alike? That's where they're thinking of ISKCON, is it? Yeah, that's the that's that's the impression of devotees. Is that you know they're all dressing alike, they're all chanting the same thing, they all think the same thing. They've given up their individuality to be it's part of this, you know, utopian. Oh, this is recent. No, this was from eighties. Uh, Still about 40 years ago. Well, okay. Um, but if we're talking about what is people's impressions, we're still kind of laboring under that image of uh, being a, a cult group or, you know, uh, when devotees show up in public, there's still some sense of, well, they're nice people. I've learned a little bit more about them and, you know, they do good things, but uh, it's not for me. I, I, I'm not a joiner. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to put on the same clothes as everybody else. So there's still that lingering sense about, mm. you know, the Hari Krishnas. I have this fight with my brother all the time. My brother calls me a Hari Krishna. Nobody calls me a Hari Krishna. Even I don't. I mean, I don't call myself a Hari Krishna. What's a Hari Krishna? There's no such thing. It's invent. It's, it's an invented phrase. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. What do you mean? There's no such thing as Hari Krishna. No, Hare Krishna are the first two words of the Maha Mantra. The first word is the, uh, the vocative of Hara, uh, uh, in, referring to the internal in energy of the Supreme Being. Yeah. Krishna is the name of the Supreme Being in personal form. It's, it's not like now you're a member of the Rotary. I mean, you know, who? <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a, it's a misnomer. It does, it's not actually, you know, technically we are Gaudiya Vaishnava. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, people probably they see us chanting Hare Krishna. That's why they call us Hare Krishnas. So it's yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah. It's a so, lazy way of <laughs> lazy way. Okay. So, so I'm just trying to understand when you showed this photo, how were you connecting that earlier with that? There's some phase of idealism, and then it went away, and then uh, I I didn't get the connection between this photo. Yeah. Was that? <laughs> Well, our subject point. is our subject Western is uh, of India. okay. Yeah, Western perceptions of India. So one misperception that people have is that uh, you know people from India 
they they dress this way, they think this way, mm. um, and uh, you know it's it's changed to a certain degree in in just the last decade or so because multiculturalism has become an important quality in business in education. Um, so there's a little bit of a greater respect for ethnic and racial origin, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. Uh, it's just, it's become somewhat more delicate. So people are more cautious, you know, about grouping everybody in the way they did for a long time. By the way, the reason things began to change in the 1960s is that there was a piece of legislation that was reversed. America, going back to those days that we were talking about before, when it was all, you know, America for Americans, Westward Ho, we're going to build our nation. Uh, and uh, it was very Christian-based. You know, America was based, was built with, with um, uh, first of all, oil money. And a lot of the oil barons, going back to the first discovery of oil in the uh, mid to late 1800s, um, was used to finance Christian missionaries, Oral Roberts and uh, you know, Billy Graham and uh, all of the uh, early powerful Christian missionaries and then the televangelists. Oh, okay. Their financing came from... Uh, oil barons, you know, John, John D. Rockefeller was uh, the, the deacon of his church. You know, you, you have people who see oil is God's plan for building a Christian world. And My so God. they use their profits and their money for, for financing ministries, still, for building right. Christian universities. My God, this is so quite a radical thought. Oil is God's plans for building a Christian world. Yes. And how do they make sense of oil being found in the Middle East? Or they can't make sense of that then? Well, now we're really getting into a, 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 <laughs> no, a I'm just complex, thinking that, complex no, no, I'm just thinking how, how... I think today Islam thinks like that also to some extent. They think that's the way they... They, they have gained power and they got gained prestige. It's amazing. I had no idea about this. I had heard at of some other that. time. Yeah. We could discuss the, uh, let's say, the backdoor relationships between American oils and the OPEC monopoly in the Middle East and so on. That's a different topic. Of course. Yeah. Now, I had, of course, heard that. <laughs> but it's connected. That you know, Christianity equated something like technical, technological advancement with religious virtue. And they said that because, because we are religious and so virtuous, so God is, a, God is blessing us with so many technological advancements by which we can prosper. So that yes. part I don't but specifically oil is interesting. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, a big, a, a big in, impetus to the uh, evolving of Christian America. And there was no room in that vision for foreigners. I mean, we could bring in Chinese to help uh, lay down railroad ties, or we'd bring in some Hindus to, uh, you know, do some of the uh, grunt labor. But they were never welcomed in America. There were, you know, Hindu. There were a few Hindu temples back in the in the late 1800s. They were burned down. You know, there were pogroms. You know, to to uh, get the foreigners out of America. And it got to a point where by 1904, Congress passed what was called the um, Anti-Asian Exclusion Act, that anyone from Asian background, India in particular, but also Japan, China, and so on, there were these very severe um, uh, limitations on, uh, on immigration. Only a handful were allowed into the country. There was something like 3,000 people a year. When were allowed was this? in. 1904 was when the act was passed. Oh, okay. And then it wasn't until 1964, I believe, huh? 60 years later, that Congress repealed the Anti Asian Exclusion Act 
or the exclusion act, Asian exclusion act. I'm not sure about the title. Okay. And finally, the doors were open, and people from Asia were allowed to come and get their green cards、mm. and live here and set up businesses and so on. And so, what, what was three thousand or four thousand people a year became three hundred thousand people a year. There's this huge jump. Okay. And that's why you know you go back to the '60s, the early to mid '60s. You see this influx of teachers, all the swamis, swami Satchidananda,、uh, you know, all these other teachers, including the Prabhupada. For the first time in American history, were allowed to come, get their green card, build their ashram, open their yoga studio or whatever it was, and teach. Which is why the 1960s in America are so often connected with. Uh, India and incense and chanting and yoga. That connection was because of, in large measure, the repeal of that Asian Exclusion Act. Oh, okay. So then there was a change. Then, then the shift in impression of India began to change more dramatically.、Mm. So, Prabhu, just、uh, to take a step back in here. So, when Prabhupad came. That did seem to be. On one side, I've heard that the, in the Lilam Road, it is said that the Swamiji was speaking to the toughest audience in the world. That, that was the time, I think, 1965. The Time magazine put an article: "Is God dead?" So, at, in one sense, they were not not at all. The hippies were not at all like submissive people who were going to hear from a guru, as they might anywhere in India. But at the same time, there while there was not submission, but there was also some curiosity, some interest. So maybe can you talk a little bit about? And, and it does seem that when Prabhupada came to New York,、uh, we could say the mainstream society in America, the people were more interested in in the yoga that Mishra was Mishra yoga studio, like that kind of people were teaching. So so it was not the mainstream that got attracted to Prabhupada so much as the hippies. So maybe. You want to talk something about how the hippies emerged and how why they were receptive, or if you have, well, I, I, yeah, that's、okay. that's fine. It, it's it's also a part of the story. We can certainly spend. But if you you had a particular flow going, you can go ahead and then you can come to this later also. No, no, no. This is this is quite organic, and we're coming、yes. to this point. That's fine. Um, be I would ask your listeners and your viewers to be cautious about something. And that is to、uh, avoid generalizations, if you can. Okay. Generally, I try to avoid generalization.、Um, the danger there is to think that this is what America was like. This is how Americans thought. It's not so. It, True. There were some people who thought in a particular way about people coming from India. Other people thought in a different way. Um, so I think we do a disservice if we try to simplify、uh, a, a complex issue.、Mm. Uh, we we like simplifications because then we can just be done with it. We can say now I understand it and I can move on to you know you want let's go get some lunch. But you haven't understood. You know it's much more complex than that. You know I noticed that、um, if among Americans in India also India is so big and complicated. So something which happens in Bihar or some place like that. And Mumbai are very different, so I guess、yes. what you're saying applies. America is bigger than India, also, and geography. Yeah, and, and yeah, I have to tell you, my my biggest disappointment, Prabhu, and and this gets very personal for me. When I first met devotees in 1969, gives you an idea how long ago.、Uh, it was in London. And there were you know, the three couples who had come from San Francisco to open the temple, and they met George Harrison, and that story is fairly well known. But this small group of us included Jai Hari, who was from Pakistan,、uh, Tribhuvanath Prabhu, Ireland. You had Americans. You had uh, uh, there were two sisters from Sweden there. There were people from France there,、um, and you know, it was never 
there was never this divisiveness that we're seeing now. No one, no one thought about anybody else in terms of, well, he's Hindu or she's Christian or that one's Jewish or, you know, uh, we were just one family. You know, we were just, and it was a wonderful thing to be together. And um, I, that's part of what the appeal for me was becoming a devotee. Like, my goodness, what a lovely environment this is, you know, where people treat each other uh, with respect as human beings. And whatever their background is, it doesn't particularly matter. I'll tell you also, truthfully, at that time, we had a young man who was gay. Uh, Radhika Raman, I think, was his initiated name. There were uh, two uh, women living together. I mean, you know, it, it's as though when, when, when Prabhupada was here, and we, we were attracted to come and maybe become his students, become initiated, whatever. No one, he, he didn't have us fill out any questionnaires. You know, have you ever been in prison? Did you finish your college education? Um, you know, do you masturbate? Uh, wh- wh- what is your attitude toward uh, Indians? You know, uh, are you a Republican or a Democrat? He, there was none of that. There was no bias against people. The feeling was, well, the past is the past. Um, You're here now. And isn't that a wonderful thing? And now we're going to serve together. It was a very beautiful, effective, meaningful atmosphere of inclusion. And I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happened to us. We've become so political. Yeah, yes, sorry. I mean, this is amazing. See, you know, we can understand inclusion in terms of, uh, say, nationalities, ethnicities, or other those things. But in terms of sexuality, so Prabhupada knew about those those uh, gays and lesbians, that gay devotee and the lesbians living together, and he was okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, look, he had his personal preferences. There was a, well, one discussion. A young man went to him and said, "Look, I'm." I'm, I'm gay, and, uh, you know, should I, should I leave the temple? Said, no, you just, you have to make up your mind about, you know, how you will be. When we have a prescription against what we're calling illicit sex, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not qualified whether that's illicit sex between uh, partners of the opposite sex or same sex. The the prescription is control yourself, become happy with one partner and dedicate yourself to serving Krishna and developing your love for Krishna. You know, these things were, at least back then, it was such common sense. It was such common sense. There was no big hoopla about it, you know. And you and I have talked about this in the past as well. So I don't. I don't want to have to reiterate that, or you know, go back and revisit that territory again with you. But the point is, if we're if we're asking about, so Prabhu, it's just to because I mean, since you brought this point up, is there's one thing that yes, yeah, somebody has to. Uh, they had a particular past, and they're trying to deal with it. So, but in in one sense, to deal with it is to stop doing it entirely. The other is that you regulate it. So you are saying that during Prabhupada's times, what applied for, you could say, straight couples was also applied for gay couples? At least in his time. Oh, okay. At least in his days. I mean, you know, this this was no big secret. I mean, we, 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 we spoke about these things when there was need to discuss them. We didn't, nobody made a big deal out of it. It wasn't a big deal. It just wasn't a big deal. We were all there together to serve Srila Prabhupada in spreading his mission. And uh, it was a very warm, affectionate, supportive environment. You know, that's, that's the movement I remember back. And I have to tell you, there are times those memories, they keep me alive. Because what I see around me sometimes is so, is so discouraging. But, uh, you know, I don't know whether you, you and I talked about this, but I spent the last 
what, year and a half, maybe two years, drafting a code of ethical behavior for ISKCON. Did we talk yeah, about it? Yeah, you mentioned that it's very difficult to make it universal because of cultural nuances. And then eventually when you made it also, it had to be pared down to bare essentials. Yeah, you know, and okay, I can, I can appreciate that uh, in some countries, I'm told in some countries of Africa, for example, homosexuality is illegal. So, you know, if we're going to establish temples and spread Krishna consciousness, you know, we can't be banned because we're breaking the law. I mean, so, you know, there are considerations like that that uh, do have to be dealt with. Um, but there, there, there are times, honestly, I, like, for example, it was shocking to me. I mean, shocking when I heard, when I learned that caste discrimination is still an issue among devotees. Really? I, where? Yeah. I never heard of this. Yeah, that, you know, that there's still, you know, uh, a, you know, a, a discrimination for among people because of their caste backgrounds. I mean, how is it? How is, yeah. how is that? How you is know, that? I, how I, is it possible? I mean, I would really need to see evidence because what I have seen in India, I mean, any devotee who has, who has, who has dedication, who has zeal. I've seen some of the, some of the leaders in ISKCON, at least in my generation, and a generation earlier also, they, whatever caste, I mean, nobody asked me what my caste is since I joined. And uh, I haven't, I know I can I right now quote at least uh, from my generation, five devotees who are temple presidents, who are conventionally co called from lower castes. So I, I suspect this might be a Western perception of India, which might not be grounded in reality because caste is... Well, very, I, I, I hope so. I hope you're I, right. I'll just qualify. Yeah, yeah. See, caste is a big yeah. reality in India, in the rural areas and in the government sector. In the rural areas, okay. because society is still stratified that way. And in the government right. sector, because there are quotas. And yeah. because... so. You know, often people from the lower caste, because of what they call here the reservation policy, and America something similar is affirmative action. So mm -hmm. that applies not just at recruitment, but it applies throughout. So a person gets promoted based on caste, not just based on caliber of right. work. Okay. So yeah. in the government circle, there is this, but I think urbanization and privatization of the economy. Uh, I don't. Uh, at least I haven't heard of caste being a major, uh, not even a major factor. Even a minor factor, okay. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm I'm not at liberty to discuss details because of course, I, I understand there's a certain confidentiality that I have to respect. Yeah, I understand. But uh, uh, but I appreciate what you're saying, and I thank you for offering me some some reassurance that maybe it's not very widespread. There may be some individual cases here and there. But but and this is the important thing. If you want to talk about what are Western impressions of India and how do those impressions influence the reception of bhakti? Hmm. There's, you know, there's still uh, uh, this rather cliched image of India as a place where, you know, people believe that, uh, you know, my karma is such that, you know, this is, I deserve this. This is my karma. Right. Um, so that's looked down upon. You know, there, there's a terrible um, shallowness in, in, in the appreciation of, of, uh, of what you know, the true wealth and, and wisdom of India is. And so we're still, you know, we're fighting that to a certain degree. And, you know, you, know, you see me, when I come to have my discussion with you, I'm wearing my kurta and, you know, I put an environment where you see my altar behind me and so on. I'm, it's a devotee viewership, and I, I like to come across uh, as part of the community. I want people, I want your viewers to know that I speak as a devotee. I don't generally dress in Dodi and Kurta. I don't. I, you know, I'm teaching in, a, in, in 
in, in different environments, educational environments. And I don't want to trigger those prejudices that people might have by presenting myself in a way that says, oh, he's one of them. He's from that group. So I try to avoid that. Mm. Um, but still, it, you know, so it's there. It's an issue. It is an issue. Yes, we don't so. so it's, so I overall, think. you could say that uh, if, if I'm understanding right, what you're saying is that the overall perception, the three things, there's a perception of India itself, there's a perception of Hinduism, and there's a perception of devotees. So now all of these are related to some extent, but there are differences also. So if I understand what you're saying is India is still perceived as a poverty stricken country, related with caste. Even after the say the sheer number of software engineers coming to America and Indians, I think in the since 1965, what you said, 1964-65, when the act was repealed, there have been many uh, professionals who have come and now, now the CEOs of top uh, companies in America are also Indians. So is that bias still there? Well, now, now you're getting, now you're talking about it. When you get into money matters, finances, business, somehow those distinctions don't have as much importance anymore. If someone has a contribution to make to your bottom line, let's hire them. Okay. Uh, but then you get another kind of cliche, you know, the cliche of the, 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 the Hindu uh, IT professional. So it's, it's almost like there's this other kind of a grouping of, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, we, we're going to find the, the kind of staffing we need for our uh, technology from that group, because there seem to be a lot of very smart people from IIT and elsewhere coming to America who have the skills that we need. I, okay. That's still not a very particularly informed or enlightened position, but okay. it's better than looking down on someone. Mm. Let me let me let me uh, let me get to what I, I think is perhaps a, at the heart of the issue that you've raised here because yeah. this is it's an important subject I've been looking so forward. To. Yeah, just before we go to that, see, I had raised a question yeah. and then I said that so Prabhupada, it seems that the main demographic that that was attracted to Prabhupada uh, was the hippies. So in the response to that, you said that you now that we shouldn't generalize that that. So was that saying that it was that well, the people who were, who were attracted to Prabhupada were not only the hippies or what was the context of that, that answer? Okay, well, first of all, that uh, it's, a, it's a mistaken idea, it's a cliche to think that Prabhupada's early disciples, students were all hippies. That's just not the case. There were some, you know, particularly in San Francisco, which was kind of the the haven for hippies and the counterculture movement back in the 60s. But if you look at the people who formed his community, let's say here in New York at 26 Second Avenue, you had Hayagriva, who was a professor of English literature at Ohio State University. You had Professor Tom Hopkins, who came up and became a, a regular visitor. Allen Ginsberg, who was a, a world-renowned poet. Uh, you had musicians from the downtown uh, jazz world in large measure who came and brought their instruments and took part in the kirtans from a musical perspective. You had some people who had studied Vedanta who were coming to understand what's the difference between what we're learning uptown and what this person is teaching downtown. And, um, the, the, you know, there were artists. Uh, Jadarani was a painter. Um, you know, uh, you know, Umapati uh, was a, uh, a sound studio technician. So Prabhu, just to uh -huh. so that's that's true. Uh, was yeah. university student. Yeah, just to quali qualify. So when maybe I had a different understanding of hippies, and uh, so so it's not just that anybody who used to experiment with drugs was considered a hippie. It is that, like somebody who had no responsible career and. 
they were not doing anything responsible in life they're hippies is that the right understanding because in one sense if right. you see yeah howard wheeler and all of them they were also into drugs and uh, so it's not just so hippies is a much uh, much broader than just the idea of experimenting with drugs but allen ginsberg was like a pioneer of taking drugs for going towards spirituality so how are you defining if you hippies? really want sure if you really want to understand about this era i recommend a book to you written by a a professor named maslow called simply the 60s There are also other books called um, "Spirituality in America." I can give you some recommendations if you like of books. Okay. Generally, what they do is they say, you know, when we talk about the hippies, if you okay. think in terms of full-time hippies, full there might have been three <laughs> hundred. Okay. You know, maybe two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand young people. That's it. Really? If you talk about weekend hippies. In other words, people who had their jobs, they were going to school, but on weekends they put on the bell bottoms, you know, they put on the beads, and they, you know, they they dance in Central Park, whatever. They add a few more. If you're talking about the um, the counterculture movement, which is different from the hippie movement, hippies were, you know, the famous uh, cliche: uh, uh, tune in, turn on, drop out. Um, they rejected the society. Counterculture was looking to build a positive alternative to society. Those are the ones who had the farm communes and so on, oh. uh, who were politically active. They, so yeah, again, beware of generalizations. You have to get a little bit more specific into what kind of a community, what kind of mindset are we talking about? Prabhupada appealed. To, I mean, my experience was, he appealed to uh, a large number, a large, large number. What is a large number? I don't know. He appealed to some people who came out of the anti-war movement because, and I'm speaking for myself here. I was uh, editor of the student newspaper, the Daily Cardinal, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I was there when we were having the. Anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in the streets of Madison, and it wasn't working. You know, the protests, the, the violent protests, just weren't doing anything to change the administration's mind about the war in Vietnam. We were still bombing like crazy. Here was Sri Lopraopad, Swamiji, we called him in those days, proposing a different kind of peace plan. That. You have to change people's hearts. You're not going to achieve peace just by reforming political agendas. You have to change their hearts. And so we found this as a a more effective form of active protest, if you will, by going out instead of um, you know with signs against the war in Vietnam with merdangas and cartels. So we were back in the streets demonstrating, as we were had been doing in college, but it was for this higher form of revolution, you might say. So Prabhupada appealed to uh, different people for different reasons, and at least for myself, it was that sense of here's a more effective form of social action. That's amazing. I'm thinking about. Uh, so Radhanath Maja also concerned about racial injustice, and so in one sense, he's not entirely a, a typical of the kind of devotees who are attracted. Of course, every devotee is an individual. Every Vaishnava is a great soul eventually, ultimately. But so it's a yeah, it's so easy to generalize. So if I understood what your idea saying is that. the counter culture was not was was quite a broad movement and there were many uh, many constructive constructive movements going on within that to change the way society worked and within that a very small but maybe uh, highly visible or highly publicized uh, section was the hippies the full as you use the word full time hippies 
Well, they were they were more visible. Sure, they were colorful, and you know, uh, the newspapers and magazines uh, could get some you know good readership if they took photographs of you know the the colorful groups. So, so those were the ones who got the attention. But that wasn't you know Prabhupada's following was not limited to that by any by any means. So when you say Prabhupada made the hippies into happies. So that is that is a true statement, but that doesn't apply to all of Prabhupada's disciples in those times. It applies to a sure. Okay, right. That was uh, someone was specifically asking about, you know, are you are your followers all hippies? Now that was a specific conversation. Sorry, what were they asking? You, know, you look, you know, are are you all of your followers hippies? And he said, well, they used to be, now they're happies. But he wasn't saying, I'm, okay. I'm here for the hippie. That, that was not his point. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> that was his point. Yeah. So again, our subject is Western impressions of India. So in one sense, you are in this process correcting some Indian impressions of the West also. Indian impressions of right. the Western followers of Prabhupada. So I think it's dynamic. It's natural. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So if, if we can move forward... So, so, so now, just to, uh, to go a little deeper into this. So, when Prabhupada came, you said that one of the things that attracted this broader demographic was there was a spiritual way to make a change. So, yeah, I never thought of that. Marching on the, going on the streets and doing Harinam was a different way of doing, uh, doing uh, marches for yeah, political for social action. Social Absolutely. Yeah. And our, our whole history, Gaudiya Vaishnav history, is a, is a history of social, social activists. What was the first uh, Nam Sankirtan? <laughs> Mahaprabhu. Yes. You know, uh, leading uh, a very large number. It wasn't a small group, it was a large number of people to uh, Chan Kazi's palace to. Uh, Make clear their objections to his interfering with the the the, the Harinam parties, and um, it got out of hand. I mean, if you read in Chaitanya Bhagavat, I think also Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's described that the uh, the followers and that that protest parade, they got a little rowdy at first. They yeah, they kind of <laughs> that's true. Messed up the flower gardens of uh, Kazi's palace and so on. And uh, Mahaprabhu, it wasn't in favor of that. You know. He sat down and he spoke uh, very politely, Chan Kazi, saying, you know, we're actually related. We're family members. You know, we have a cousin. <laughs> He's, you know, establishing a nice foundation there, friendly talks. See, this, this, this is um, the elegance of, 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 of our movement. It's not this divisiveness that, that we're seeing in Washington, you know, fighting and yelling. It's, it's uh, really, anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I get a little bit. No, I understand. Up, so. So, so, maybe, so how did, okay, you talked about uh, this dimension of how it was a form of social action. But could you talk a little bit about, say, how did the perceptions of India either contribute or detract from people getting attracted to Prabhupada when he came there? Right. Did it play any significant role? Like, I do know that Haigri Prabhu and uh, Kirtan, uh, Kirtan Mahaj, they had earlier gone to India. So it seems that at least some people thought of India as a, as a land where they could learn more about spirituality. Yes. Yes. That was on the plus side. India was seen as kind of the, the home of mysticism. Okay. If there was wisdom to be found, if we can find the meaning of life, it is likely we will find it in India. That was on the plus oh. side. Okay. Because India was... You know, the birthplace of so many great teachers and the avatars had come in India and, you know, the great Sanskrit texts and so on. But there was um, an appreciation for India. It wasn't all negative. There was an appreciation for India as this 
place where there are great mysteries that can be unraveled. You know, if we just find the right teacher. And uh, one thing I recall from those years, I'm going back to the 60s now, is that um, people coming from India taught a little bit of the mystery or they hinted at some kind of wisdom. Nobody had the whole picture. When Prabhupada came, he gave the whole picture. He was the first person, at least for me, who actually explained what is the wisdom of the East? You know, what is the mystery that India can solve? He was the first person to do that. Everybody else, you got, oh, maybe it's this or, you know, some, <laughs> you know, there was some partial truths about the illusory nature of the material world and inner self, you know. It wasn't clear, it wasn't substantial until Prabhupada came. And then it was very clear and very simple. That was the beauty of his presentation. You know, it was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that answers the questions. Everyone else saying, no, it's a great mystery. <laughs> it's only a mystery until you understand what it is, what it is. And Prabhupada explained it. But India had that appeal. There was always that appeal that, you know, the yogis in the Himalayas and the the mystics in the mountains and the forests and so on. There was some truth to be found there. Okay. And uh, so there at least there was some openness, but eventually Prabhupada had to had to, you could say, to use commercial language, sell sell the product. Although there was some interest about the product, it was Prabhupada who, as you said, provided the whole product which had its own attraction. He had to fight those misimpressions of India. Yes. yes. Okay. He had to correct the misimpressions. Okay. The first misimpression was that bhakti is Hindu. <laughs> the first misimpression is that he was saying, don't, don't think this is Indian religion. He said, I have to say that a lot, you know, because people would look at the boat and say, oh, they're Hindus. They're from India. No, 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 no. The sun rises in the east. That doesn't make it an eastern sun. That was the explanation, the example he used. So that was the first misimpression of India that Prabhupada had to rectify. Then he had to rectify so many other misimpressions like, uh, well, uh, women are inferior he said, when you read that sort of thing, that's a material distinction. He said, in Krishna consciousness, there's full equality. He had to rectify that misimpression. So, I mean, it, I would say that it was Prabhupada who created that impression by talking about his purports and other places. I don't know whether he rectified it. Mm. Well, <laughs> that was part of the... That's part of the challenge that we're confronting today. Yeah, there's a, I, a lot I, I of discussion. What, you're saying that, uh, what I mean, what my understanding is that the, maybe his writings created that impression, but in his personal dealings, he rectified that impression. But I don't. Yeah, think this is. Um, yeah, you uh, and I have talked about this before. Yeah, we can talk about it separately. How do we, how do we deal with the controversial statements in Prabhupada's yes, books? That's true. <laughs> We've, we've talked about that. Yes. There's an, uh, an issue of the ISKCON Communications Journal coming out next year, specifically dedicated to this theme. How do we, how do we understand the controversial statements? The, the article that I was asked to write was about Hitler. Sometimes it seemed maybe like Prabhupada said that Hitler was a gentleman or he was a good man. Uh, there's an article about Prabhupada's statement about women. <clears throat> Uh, oh, okay. so it's a whole issue coming out next year of the ISKCON Communications Journal dedicated specifically to to this topic. Oh, okay, that's wonderful. Actually, I love the ISKCON Journal articles, and it was such a loss when for almost a decade we didn't have it. And I think last year they published, yeah. uh, this year they published one issue. There's a lot yeah. of deep, serious yeah. reflection in each article in the journal. Yeah, so it's it's been revived. Uh, mostly the credit goes to Mahaprabhu uh, Martin Gurvich, who is a, 
a devotee from Belgium. At least he has a, a art gallery in Belgium. He he's uh, he's put resources into and time and effort to re reno, reviving the ICJ. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think that's an important topic to discuss. I'm also part of Shastri Karadari Council. We wrote a paper on hermeneutics, and that's also I think that's a major issue for us to as a movement to negotiate. And let's say a whole different subject. So you could say that Prabhupada, there were some positive perceptions, some negative perceptions. Now, if we move forward, still Prabhupada was substantially <coughs> successful uh, in taking Krishna Bhakti to, to Americans. And now today we see things have gone down substantially. So now there are, of course, you could say internal ISKCON reasons why that happened. Uh, but apart from those, you could mention that if you like a little bit, but are there, has there been a change in the perceptions of India, which, uh, which has affect, affected either positively or negatively the receptivity toward India? Uh, from my, uh, from what I said, two things, from what you said, one thing struck me that people are more because of multiculturalism, there is a greater level of openness. So that could be a positive development. And yoga has also become far bigger than what it was at that time. So that could also be seen as a positive development. Mm. Yes. Um, of course, we're confronting in ISKCON as an institution what some people have characterized as the Hinduization of ISKCON. Um, and so people get an impression, if they just judge by what they see when they come into a temple, it appears to be primarily staffed or appealing to people of uh, 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 Indian extraction. That's the impression, because a lot of the people now are from India. Um, again, it's a topic that has a history to it. <clears throat> In the 70s, when we had our strong income coming from book distribution, um, the balance, the demographics were a bit more equalized. After the book distribution went down, uh, there was an influx of money coming from Hindus who would attend ISKCON temple functions as their home away from home because the Devi worship standard is so high, because the prashadam is so tasty. Because the festivals are celebrated with such um, care and attention. So there were <clears throat> an increase in the number of uh, Indians attending Iskand temples. So there, when there were fewer Westerners, fewer people of white skin, and more people of Indian extraction, some people got the impression, well, this must be in India. So that's an issue that, you know, that is raised and discussed. Okay. <clears throat> How to deal with that. Mm, uh, that's a major issue. In one sense, uh, I recently read a book on religion in America, and it seems that uh, what Martin Luther King, Martin, yeah, Martin Luther King, he said that the time of uh, like what Saturday 11 o'clock or Sunday 11 o'clock, the time when people go to church, he says, that is the most demographically divided time in America. When people go to their own churches or their own churches of their own particular denominations, which could be mm -hmm. regional or ethnic or whatever. So it seems that religion is a place where people come and congregate according to not just their faith, but also their ethnography. So that's the ethnicity rather. So that could also be an issue. If we are primarily, an in, we have primarily seen as an Indian movement or a Hindu movement or a movement made of Indians primarily. Well, that was another misimpression that Srila Prabhupada had to rectify. Yeah. That Krishna consciousness is a religion. It's not a religion. Not only is it not Hinduism, it's not any kind of religion. Now, there are, it's the nature, it's dharma, it's the, it's the nature of life itself, all right? So that he had to remedy. 
Now, some yeah. people in a like, just a minute. engage with Krishna consciousness. Okay, go ahead. Please go ahead. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, even Krishna now acknowledges in Bhagavad Gita. He says, some people want me to be their worshipable God. If they come to me, they're in distress, whatever. So I'm their God. <laughs> and, and that's fine. It's not going to be particularly attractive to non-Hindus, though. If it's presented in that way, well, this is, you know, a religion that comes from India. Mm. Why was Prabhupada so enthusiastic about the Bhakti Vedanta Institute? Why was supporting his scientist disciples the one area where monies given from the BBT did not have to be reimbursed? Where that group was to be supported? It's because he wanted to establish that Krishna consciousness is not a religion, it's a science. Therefore, what these PhD devotees are doing is extremely important. So he supported them. He was sending them $10,000 a month from the BBT to pay for the rent and, and the prashadam and travel and whatever else they needed so they could work full time to establish this rational, objective foundation of bhakti, not as a Hindu religion, not as a religion of any kind, but as the non-material source of life. That, that was at the heart of his, his whole mission in, in, in the world, was to do that. Okay. I think that's a, that's a major challenge to deal with. Now, you know, saying that Krishna consciousness is not a religion is almost a imposing the paramarthic on the vyavaharic, the transcendental on the material. It's like saying Vrindavan is not in India. That's true, Vrindavan is in the spiritual world, but if you want to put it anywhere in the map of the world, we have to put it in India. So similarly, Krishna consciousness, yes, it is transcendental, but if you want to put it anywhere in the categorization of the world, we're not going to call it a science that is going to be studied in the physics or chemistry or biology. We are going to study it as a religion. So I'm not sure whether uh, we can that categorically reject the fact that we can say that, yes, it is not what is normally thought of as a religion. There are yeah. significant differences, but, yeah. but uh, to categorically say it's not a religion would be, I I'm, might, I'm, I'm Prabhupada wanted it to show that we have a scientific basis. And there are statements of Prabhupada both ways. That uh, and he said that we are not a religion, but then Prabhupada would talk about uh, Hindus and especially in terms of say Indians right. supporting the temples. At that time, he did use the word Hindus. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada was somebody for everything, and and the beauty of okay. uh, of Krishna is that uh, he is truth on many levels. You know, he's not he's not one dimensional. He's, he's not a one dimension. <laughs> He's a uh, uh, an equal opportunity divinity. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautifully put. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. He can accommodate uh, people, whatever their particular motive is uh, for approaching him. But we have to be very, very clear about this privilege. This is very, very important. The physicalist scientific paradigm, what is sometimes called naturalism, is is Maya's single strongest weapon. It is the, the crown jewel of the, the tools of Kali Yuga for keeping souls enslaved in the cycle of birth and death. Irrefut irrefutable, concrete evidence that you are your body. We, we have to understand how, how serious this is. <clears throat> you know, I've, we, we have no problem with, with science, but those individuals who would misuse science as a, a, to, as a weapon, who would weaponize science as some kind of uh, um, 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 a path to defeat religion, to prove atheism over theism, 
that that's a systematic campaign that has to be addressed. And that that's where Prabhupada, you know, displayed his warrior qualities. He was outraged at people who would use the who would use the presumption of science to to prove that God does not exist. I, I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago by a, a lovely gentleman who uh, um, his name was uh, um, well never mind his name, but he was from uh, Oxford and he was a a um, um, a biophysicist. And uh, he was giving, the reason I was watching it, it, it was a one hour summary about how life works. And it was a wonderful exposition about <clears throat> molecules coming together. And, you know, from a, a purely objective perspective, it was for a non-scientist like me, it was a wonderful overview of the workings of life. And then at the end, out of nowhere, he says, and all of this is happening without need for any God. And I'm, I'm thinking, what, why was that necessary? I, why, you know, when I go to the dentist to get a cavity filled, at the end of filling my cavity, my dentist doesn't turn to me and say, and I did that without God. Okay. He's just filling the cavity, you know, and <laughs> Why does everything have to be, you know, why do you have to weaponize science to disprove the existence of God? I don't see why that's necessary. Mm. But that seems to be now some kind of unspoken okay. obligation. Okay, that so me, we are going yeah. to prove that this universe, has, there's no soul, there's no transcendental cause to anything. There is just matter. That's all there is. Prabhupada was, was outraged at this. How dare you? How dare you deny people their own spiritual identity? How dare you try to mislead them into thinking that there is nothing but matter to creation? You have no evidence. You have never proved that consciousness evolves from some interaction of material particles and forces. How dare you declare otherwise? How presumptuous of you? How dangerous of you? Because you are robbing people of their hope that they have any kind of, of uh, dignity to their own being. He was outraged at this. So uh, it's really important. You know, you want to understand something about misimpressions of India. I mean, th this goes to the heart of it. This was Prabhupada's mission. This was his mission right here. So, so yes, of course. Yeah, of course. So yeah, when you're talking about Krishna consciousness as a science, you're talking about how Prabhupada was quite uh, strong in recognizing that uh, science has been weaponized against, against religion or against God, against spirituality. And that's why Prabhupada wanted to counter that. So that was your emphasis when you're talking about Krishna consciousness as a science. Yes. And, and, and part, of, part of that was to make very clear to people that Krishna consciousness is not a religion. Religion is something material. Religion is a historic construct. It has a moment of origin in time. Islam, Christianity, th these are religions that have a moment of origin in historic time. Now, ideally, religions point to that ahistoric, non-material, ethos underlying all life. Ideally, that's what religions do. But the purpose of religion is to create a social construct where people can be safe, where life can be lived harmoniously. It gives people uh, uh, a, a structure to their lives, rituals, a, a, a worldview, a healthy worldview. Uh, you know, it plays that role. But it's not eternal truth. And Prabhupada was adamant that we had. When did you ever hear Prabhupada say, you know, everyone should become Hindu? I mean, no, of course, Prabhupada never said that. That he never said. <laughs> so, you know, this, this goes to the heart of his mission. True. So, so if I understand right, what you are saying is, even today, that major misconception that uh, 
we are perceived as a as a religion that will have to be addressed if we are going to reach out to if bhakti wisdom is to reach out bhakti is to reach out to the western western audiences or broader audiences that's a major yeah yeah and and you know me well enough probably i mean you know that my take on that is that it will communicate best when we demonstrate a contribution to solving the, the issues of society hmm. when we can demonstrate that the bhakti perspective has practical application in the world that it has a contribution to make toward resolving climate change toward alleviating poverty uh, contributing to education the rights of underrepresented minorities uh, to the peace process when we can demonstrate that practical contribution then people i think will begin to appreciate oh there's something more to this than hinduism okay now oh, so what that would require is if we whatever whatever we could say whatever box or bracket people we have put us in if we if we become resources or provide some insights or uh, by which pro- society's problems can be solved then it's organically we will be people won't won't be able to place us in those boxes any further then naturally we will emerge as as different from that bigger than that so it's not so much preaching we are not this but actually tangibly showing what we are doing or what we what we can offer that's what will make a difference contributing to quality of life contributing to remedying the terrible dilemma that we have uh, come to in terms of the the terrible price that's being paid for our technological advancements mm. um that's not a, a religious thing you can call it spiritual if you like but uh being able to articulate that the long term solution to these challenges must come not from just a reconfiguring of material circumstances but by redefining the very nature of life itself why uh, should we why that? should i not, not reconfigure redefining the nature of life itself not reconfiguring yeah, the, what the long term solutions short term solutions you can come up with by throwing money at a problem by you know redistributing something by attacking it materially from some other angle long term solutions will not come just by reconfiguring the circumstances around the problem or the challenge they'll come when there is a change of heart within us that will motivate a permanent reform of attitudes behaviors corporate uh, uh uh values we have to redefine what it means to succeed what is success in life you cannot de- come to an answer to that question without first knowing who you are what is life and you know like every day prabhu every day you turn on the television you read the newspaper the message is you are your body you are your body buy this thing it'll make you look more beautiful eat this it'll make you more healthy use this medicine it'll cure your disease everything is about the body where's the knowledge of the self and even when you listen to the so-called self-help gurus and the so-called spiritual teachers and the podcasts and everything what are they talking about they're talking about relieving stress <laughs> you know they're talking about becoming more calm more peaceful within yourself all material things that'll disappear like that as soon as the next dilemma comes up boom it's gone i remember a teaching yoga studios and i watched these classes the end of every yoga class 10 minutes of savasana you lie there ah now you feel good how long does it last 1 minute as soon as you leave the studio you're back in the street bam where's your savasana where's your shanti 
<laughs> it's all gone. There's all, all these material solutions. You cannot arrive at a permanent solution without first defining this. And that was Prabhupada's great contribution. And that is what bhakti is all about. And that's the misimpression that, that we have to remedy here. That somehow spirituality means uh, de-stressing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You get me all worked up, you know. <laughs> I can see your concern and compassion coming out too. It's so... So, so if you want to say, a very good note to... to it's almost like we have gone in a complete circle. Whatever we, the, Prabhupada, one of Prabhupada's emphasis was on that our essential identity is spiritual. And whatever we, the specific perceptions, misperceptions that might be there in different parts of the world, about different parts of the world, we could say that this is the, this is the ultimate foundation which we are trying to address. And if you address this, then, then other things will fall in place. Yeah, I truly hope, I pray this every day, <clears throat> that our temples and ISKCON as an institution will continue to evolve a new kind of educational foundation, a platform where instead of the same, pardon me, I don't mean to be insulting, but instead of the same cliched Bhagavad Gita classes that you hear day after day after day, <clears throat> there would be deeper discussion about the important issues of the world and how Krishna consciousness intersects with those situations and how what we have to offer is something very relevant to the world we live in, to the people around us. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, we, there's a lot of work to do there. There's a lot of work to be done. Mm, true. True, there's one topic. I mean, we have come to a devotional note. If you have time, we could discuss this or we could discuss this separately. One point was there, which is about, uh, which, uh, which annoys many Indians in Western perceptions of India, that often India, especially if we read New York Times or if we read uh, many mainstream newspapers, they seem to have a very prejudiced view of India. Uh, very rarely, say, India launched a space missile, uh, sp India had a space mission, which was almost like 1 the cost of what NASA did. And we were fairly successful. But instead of lauding that, there was a cartoon which said that, you know, this is, this is a poor man going to space. They are begging and then they're going to space. So that, that's just one example. But almost everything that happens... Uh, it's given a negative perspective, perspective that, say, any kind of political agitation happens and the Kashmir issue came up, then it was seen as, it was, it was basically a political law and right, law and order issue, but it was given a religious tilt. So same thing with many things like that. So uh, now one understanding that I had is that to some extent, Indians themselves are responsible for this, in, that, that Indians have not endeavored to have themselves represented properly in the media. Indians go into the STEM fields and they become engineers and doctors and professionals, but they don't go into the fields which influence public opinion. They don't go into journalism so much. They don't go into law. They don't go into maybe politics that much as other demographic, other people. So it's we ourselves could be a factor that we never really cared for how we were being pursued. But uh, would you like to address this point briefly before we finish? Or it's a different subject? This is why I love my talks with you. You, you, know, you go to the heart of the, the most challenging and the most important issues confronting us today. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to you. I really am. I'm very appreciative for the chance to have these kinds of, of discussions I mean, we've been talking now for an hour and 45 minutes. I don't know if, I, if anybody's even left out there listening to what we have to say, but I'm glad to be talking with you. And, and um, you're right. Uh, instead of just encouraging people to become, um, I don't know, Pujaris and, and uh, uh, temple presidents, why not, why not have a school of journalism? You know, <laughs> why not have a, 
why not encourage people to, to become educators? I mean, that, that's where the opinions are formed. Opinions are formed, people form their opinions, yeah, what they read, but more what they view. I think we need a union of Vaishnava uh, uh, broadcasters, you know, people who will produce content for wide distribution on the big screen, on the small screen, that remedies what you're talking about. These misimpressions of India as this contradictory place where uh, they don't pay any attention to their own slums and, and people are running around starving, but they're launching satellites into space. These cliches are so hackneyed and they're so naive and they're so stupid that uh, it almost doesn't bear discussion, you know, because anyone who looks at India and continues to say, oh, yeah, very impoverished place. You know, I and mean, what are you going to do? That, that's just the world going on, doing its stupid business one more day. You know, the, the people who are thoughtful, they want to know. So what is your opinion coming from your culture? What is your opinion about the hostilities in the Middle East? Coming from your background, you know, from a knowledge of, you know, your texts and, and, and so on. What is your opinion of, um, uh, of, of, of SpaceX, you know, and, and the colonizing of, of, the, of the universe? You know, uh, I mean, these are important issues that we have positions on, but no one's asking. No one's asking our opinion of these things. Uh, so we may have to take a more proactive role here. And that means having people who are, you know, in these fields and, and connecting the dots, making the connections between the situation in the world and, and, what, and the, the perspective that's offered by what we make. I, I call the bhakti perspective. I don't like, it's not the Vedic perspective. That's, it's more, how does bhakti, you know? That's a nice word. How, how, Actually, the Vedic yeah. observer, we had the BTG column, but... Vedic is too broad and it's, it doesn't convey what you're doing. And it may even be too specific. It generally refers to Chatur Vedi, you know, Rig Sama, Darja, and, and Yajur Vedas. And, and th those are rules for forest dwellers. You know, it's rituals for the renunciants. It's not, it's not the yeah. world we're living in today. Yeah, my so brother I, makes the same yeah. mistake. He, he says, my, yeah, I have a brother who follows the Vedic perspective. I, what is he talking about? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It's silly. So your brother uses the word Vedic yeah. perspective, you're saying? Well, look, I think he's trying to be complimentary. He's interviewed a lot, and he'll bring me into the discussion uh, as a way of saying, you know, there are many different ways of looking at the world. You know, my brother, for example, is a Hare Krishna, and he follows the Vedic perspective, you know, and for him... Uh, he brought it up because his most recent book, which is called Till the End of Time, the last sentence of the book is about, he's, he's, he's given 300 pages of physicalist science about there's nothing but matter, there's nothing but physics. And then at the end he says, and this of course nourishes our soul. The last word in the book is soul. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, you owe me royalties. Come on, work over the money. <laughs> You're going to use those kinds of words. You got to pay me. So on this radio broadcast with uh, a woman named uh, Krista Tippett, she has a wonderful show called On Being. And he talked about me and said, uh, so, you know, my brother asked me, was that for me that you use that word soul in your book? It's fine. It's, it's all in good fun. And we love each other very much. But someday I hope he'll, he'll take the time to, you know, look into it so he's, he doesn't continue to misrepresent me in that way. Mm. You know. Okay. So... Anyway. So, so just to round off this point, so you're saying that uh, the biases exist not because particularly the media is biased, but because nobody has worked to correct the, correct the biases? Or is that the way we should look at it so that we can do something about it beyond just complaining or uh, becoming negative? Well, we've reached a point in the 60 odd years of our existence as a, as a society, as a movement, where the responsibility has shifted. It's no longer the emergency work that it was in the 1960s or 1970s. The obligation today is, as you are doing with your program, 
to go deeper inside the issues that are relevant to the vast majority of humanity and to contribute a new light, a new perspective on possible ways out of the darkness, possible solutions to very complex issues. Not a comprehensive, not to presume that we have some comprehensive way of solving climate change, that, that's silly. But making our small contribution to a multidimensional approach to a, a, a challenge such as climate change. And that comes from a respect to the, for the dignity of all life. That, that we can do, that we're uniquely situated to do. We need writers, we need filmmakers, we need documentarians, we need educators, we need uh, journalists, we need uh, scientists, we need people researching these fields who can make those connections. I believe that's our future. That's our future. That's where we're going as a movement, as a society. And, and we're a little bit slow. We better pick up the speed here, pick up the pace. Slow, yeah, that's true. I think we have got too caught in our own, uh, uh, our own definitions of success and our own standards and our own conceptions. And in one sense, the broader world, what is happening, we have become somewhat insular which is a challenge feel. And I think podcasts like these, where you are expressing the need for broadening our conceptions or broadening our, our conceptions of what we are meant to do in the world so that we can change people's conceptions of who we are. This is our big, big service too. I, I, I would suggest that you issue a challenge to everyone who watches your podcasts or listens to your podcast that they should come back to you with suggestions for how the message of bhakti culture can be applied in the larger world. Let's, let's stimulate some discussion. You're the ideal magnet for attracting that kind of energy because you're, you're, you're all about exploring these issues. Let's get real, let's get practical. Why not ask the people who are seeing this or listening to your programs to, to proactively come up with some ideas. You know, let's, let's, get it, let's get a discussion started here. You know, what is our contribution? What is our per perception or position on, uh, on uh, uh, recombinant uh, uh, genetic engineering? What is our mm. position on, on, on uh, uh, GMOs? What, you know, what's our position on um, alternative energy? You know, should we be going into space? Should we be doing this? Should we get some talk going on here? You know, it's a very, it's exciting. You know, very, very exciting. Is science wrong? Here's a very good topic for discussion that should interest a lot of people. When, whether it's my brother or whoever, looks out at this magnificent creation and says, you know, if you follow the physics far enough, we can describe everything, including consciousness. Are they actually wrong? Or is there a dimension of truth to what they're saying that might be perhaps just incomplete? I mean, we need to find points of, of harmony, points of tangency, where we can work cooperatively with people who may have a very, very different perspective from ours because the, 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 the odds are very high now. You know, the stakes are high. I don't know, you know, look at today's newspaper, the front page headlines in today's newspaper about the ICC coming out with their first report in 15 years mm -hmm. and showing that the science behind climate change is more convincing and, 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 and detailed than ever that human actions are at the cause of the devastation that's going on and that we're at a real tipping point here. We're at a real tipping point. We've got to make some serious changes immediately if we're going to avoid even further damage in the near future. Already, there are millions of people being displaced by rising tides, by 
uh, by out of control fires in California and elsewhere. These are real issues. We have something to say about it. We have something to say about that. We're not saying it. True. That's that's shameful. That's absolutely shameful. So I would I would encourage you to send a, a, a challenge out to everyone who sees your show. Come back, become part of the solution, get involved now. It's important. Time is wasting. Hmm. Yes, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think that will give us also a lot of uh, a lot of ideas for future podcasts. And of course, I would say that what you mentioned earlier about the the typical Bhagavad Gita classes. Sometimes we have these uh, grandiose sounding statements: "Krishna consciousness is the solution to all problems." You know, we need to actually. It's it's not grandiose in the sense that it is true ultimately, but we need to explain how it is true. Not just to make a slogan that it is true. You to explain That's it. How- That's it. Yeah. You said it. You said it. That's it. Krishna consciousness is the solution to all problems. Okay. Prove it. Show me. Show me how. Mm. Don't just spout cliches at me. That's boring. And shallow. Are you boring and shallow? Is that who you are? Show me something. That's true. I think this is where serious intellectual engagement with the contemporary world is what is going to be required. Yeah, we better do it soon. There may, there may not be a world left to, uh, to fix. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> oh, so, God. Anyway. So, you know, I appreciate your uh, broad vision. Instead of saying that, now, maybe our movement is not having sufficient followers and maybe we will not have many Western devotees in our movement. You're saying that you know, if we do, it's not that we are preaching just for spreading our movement. It's we are sharing actually to help the world. And uh, so in that sense, yeah. it's it's not survival. It's not simply survival. It's actually... Mm, it's... Uh, we, that's true. Why don't we just like expect people are going to magically, you know, start coming to our temples and chanting Hare Krishna? <laughs> that is so silly. Show something that's worth following. We don't we don't deserve a bigger following or a bigger movement if we have nothing practical to offer. What's the point? True. Anyway, so I, actually, bro, when, <laughs> I, I'm sorry if I get a little. <laughs> no, 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 you don't have to apologize, bro. Again, again. but I appreciate your what you're saying. This is, this is amazing. It's, again, I am realizing the same point that in different ways that rather than you know looking at what is wrong in the world, we can look at what we are doing wrong and fix it. So rather than saying people are not coming to a movement, you, the way you put it is. We don't deserve more people coming to the movement if we are not actually doing our work of presenting what the movement is offering properly. Let let them let them take some adult education course somewhere. You know, let them practice Buddhism. Let them do something that gives them some satisfaction. Because if they're not finding it here, why should they be here? You know, where where where's the substance behind our declarations? You know, we, we have we have work to do. Work to do. Yes, bro. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, there's something which uh, I I mean many things I appreciate about your our podcast, but one thing I strongly appreciate is that that the you could say. There is like a missionary zeal among many of our preachers. And I, I sometimes feel inspired and energized, just like some people have an energy that they want to go out and open centers and preach and make devotees. And that has its own uh, spiritual potency and vibrancy to it. But when sometimes we get into intellectual discussions, sometimes the, the compassionate reason be, or the compassionate purpose of the intellectual def- reflections gets lost. So we can just mm-hmm. get caught in this, okay, this topic and this topic. But what I yeah. see very strongly present within you is 
that yes, we want to go deep intellectually. Is see, it's not. It, it, we can't just be hasty, as you said. We can't just be keeping keep repeating cliches. But while going deep intellectually, the compassionate uh, purpose is, also comes out very vibrantly or very vividly. I would say vividly and vibrantly both in our discussions. So I appreciate that. Sometimes it's easy for those who are intellectuals to get so caught in the head, mm-hmm. not in the head in the sense that they don't have a heart, but we get get, get caught in the re- arguments and counter arguments and the reasoning and the abstractness of the subject that the concreteness of the mission that we have the purple compassion that we have that we can get lost yeah, you're touching my heart here Prabhu. it's a uh... yeah, i'm i'm good it's Actually, a little hard sense. for me Sorry. i mean we Prabhupada came and he gave us our lives back and he gave us back our souls you know and what are what are we doing to help others retrieve their souls? How can you expect people to understand the glories of uh, Mahaprabhu if uh, if uh, if they're just suffering from you know institutional racism and uh, earning uh, thirty cents on the dollar because they're Black or Hispanic, or because they're a woman, or, you know, or or they they can't afford medicine, you know, because they're living in America where medicine is basically just legalized criminality. You know. Legalized uh, criminality, because it is so expensive. Yes, yes, it's for the rich. You can have good medicine. You can have good legal support if you have money. And if you don't have money to hell with you, you're going to die in, uh, in, in prison. That's America. That's America. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I just think we're supposed to be doing something. Otherwise, our declarations of loving everyone are simply hollow lies. Empty, hollow lies. I can't think of other ones. I'm sorry. That's anyway. Maybe we should say goodbye now. <laughs> yes, <bro. laughs> That's but I love the statement, you know, without action, without compassionate action. So Prabhupada retrieved our souls. Ret- was the word you use retrieved or saved our I, I don't use the word saved. You retrieved, you said it. They retrieved our souls. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Gave us back. Gave us we, back. We had, we, yeah. We had lost them and he gave it back to us. Okay. We help them, we help people to do the same thing. That's anyway. true. It's a very heartfelt note though. Should I try to summarize? I don't think I summarize can, can encapsulate what all we discussed, but I, I can try in a few minutes. Oh, good luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I need it today. <laughs> so we broadly discussed the topic of Western perceptions of India and how they affected um, uh, how they affected receptivity to Indian spirituality and bhakti. So we started by talking about how, while well, West is almost, the word term West has become like a cliche. Early, pram, earlier it was the Europe, Europe and primarily Britain. So because of their colonial intention, that Vasco da Gama incident was amazing. He thought there's a Catholic temple uh, and it's strange deities, strange saints. So, but uh, they, when they came to India, they often wanted to deride uh, so they thought that Krishna, they separated Krishna and they said Krishna is an immoral god. And Krishna in Vrindavan at least is a, the, of an immoral god. And they said that, in, that the bhakti tradition or the, the theistic temple worship tradition is all deviant and uh, they derided it. And uh, then conversely, the so they had their agenda for misrepresenting and Indian teachers also who went to the West they also, they also said bhakti is for the less intelligent people and, and eventually, so they, they privileged the Advaitic interpretation. So there was a certain amount of misrepresentation and you said till 1960s almost, India was seen as a very poor country. So not only was it religiously negatively, but also, um, also cultural or economically negatively. And there were pockets of appreciation like Emerson and Thoreau, but that didn't last for very long. 
and over a period of time uh, from american perspective uh, because america also went through its own history and there was hostility towards america immigrants america is for americans so from 19 was it 1904 to 1964 was an anti asia act so that is also an indication of the negativity towards asia in general what is and including india but, but there was some receptivity towards indian spirituality that india is the land you go to if you want to gain wisdom and i know the meaning of life and i think one major point which you which i personally learned was that the hippies were just a very small subsection of the counter culture and the counter culture was involved in many constructive causes and so they just re when they reformulated that how that constructive constructive cause could be done through bhakti so instead of going on political marches for social justice we saw harinam sankirtan as a form of social action spiritual social action socialized social action so we have to avoid generalizations so prabhupada attracted a very broad demographic of people and allowed that usage of uh, full time hippies and part time hippies so it's quite insightful and then when we moved on so so prabhupada still had to do the hard work of uh, of presenting krishna consciousness and you said when while there were uh, while there was appreciation for indian spirituality like a gen- generic thing but overall when prabhupada presented the whole picture you could say the whole product and that was what attracted and then you also mentioned that during prabhupada's time there was a mood of inclusion and uh, people from different nationalities and with different sexual orientations they all lived and together and they so they 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 all practiced bhakti together and then we moved on to modern times or today's world we could say so because of various internal dynamics in this india or in america in iskon america uh we became our movement became primarily catering towards indians and then we discussed about how krishna consciousness is not a religion in the sense that today science is being weaponized to critique critique god and condemn religion and prabhupada was strongly against that that this was the only project that bhakti anand was the only project that prabhupada wanted to put money into without expecting any returns from this is prabhupada was very conscious of how important prabhupada that was for prabhupada and then broadly in today's world indians have become uh, software engineers and uh, uh, they are prominent but it's more that it's a utilitarian appreciation that if you can expand my bottom line then wherever you are from doesn't matter i will um, uh, you know you can we will work together but that is also another kind of silo that our people have been put in but the but overall in today's world because there is some some movement toward non judgmentality and multiculturalism so there are some positives but more important is that we are being increasingly seen as a religion and uh, that is why we will not be able to attract a broad demographic and then i think the key take away toward the end was that we have to show how our wisdom can address problems in the real world today problems like especially the environmental crisis or political violence in different parts of the world and if we do that then that is how actually we are we are carrying forward our legacy and you said otherwise our declarations for loving krishna or loving everyone they are just hollow lies and yes as devotees we may we can't we have to go beyond making slogan hearing that krishna consciousness is the solution to all problems but actually show how we can offer solutions and then we can uh, uh, and then we can actually uh, attract a lot more people otherwise we don't deserve to attract some people more people and if we don't do something urgently there may not be a world left to preach to yeah. that was very you could say empoweringly sober if i may say <laughs> thank you prabhu you want to add any concluding words not this time just very grateful for you and for what you're doing and, uh, giving me a chance to uh, spout off for a little while i am grateful that you are sharing not just your head but your head and heart together so 
compassionately. Thank you very much. I look forward to having many more podcasts with you in the future. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.